I realize that it's the end of the day and you're all like zonked and uh, so feel free to stand up and like just do you know some quick stretching or something beforehand and we'll get you sent off to dinner. And once again, there are lots of seats up front. So uh, if you, you know, have bad vision, you just want to be a little closer, you can see my emotive expressions better, come on up. Okay, hopefully you can hear me all right. I think uh, we're good to get started here. So welcome, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm gonna talk about some wireframing. If you have never touched a wireframe before, that's totally cool. Um, we'll keep things pretty foundational, but hopefully, you know, even if you're doing this daily, um, you can learn a little something, get, get refreshered. Um, my name's Garrett Voorhees. I'm a senior designer at Chapter 3 out of San Francisco and um, part of our, our design team there. You can go check out our website, I suppose. Wireframes. Wireframes. So why, why do we make wireframes? This should be a, a poem. You can explore iterations really quickly with a wireframe, which is something you can't do if you're producing you know, super high fidelity visual design comps. It allows you to focus on usability before you worry about those design matters. It can serve as a technical reference for your developers, which is often really important if there's any sort of handoff from you know, your role doing UX or wireframe stuff, and then you know a developer might pick that up months later and need to kind of figure out what's going on or what the structure is and how they're going to build from those wireframes. Uh, it saves you a ton of time and effort, and what I mean by this is it's easy to, uh, to go in this kind of endless cycle of uh, you know, feedback loops with a client, and if you can iron out kind of these early structural decisions and get that like signed off, it can really save you a whole bunch of hassle. Uh, they're also extremely testable, and this kind of um, you know, relates to the usability. You can get a few people in a room, print out your wireframes on a piece of paper, or help just you know, sketch them on a piece of paper, and uh, very quickly assess how successful they are, how effective you know, the, the workflow is, or whatever it is that you're testing. So why, why shouldn't we just like dive right into design? It's, it's a really tempting thing to, uh, to wanna just jump in and you know, I've done this before and usually it, it doesn't really work out. Um, but sometimes you'll have just this mental image of what the site should be and it's in your head and you wanna just like get it down, you know, on, on metaphorical paper. Um, but you could go that route and make like an insanely beautiful comp, it looks perfect, and then the next day your client changes requirements and all of your work is you know, effectively obsolete or uh, partially. So don't be that guy, stick with your uh, wireframes. So we, we at chapter three seem to love this analogy that building a website is like building a house. So I like to say that wireframes are kind of the blueprint of your website. Um, and so this is, just a side note, a blueprint schematic of the Tower of Terror, which I thought was kind of cool looking, and it serves for a nice visual. But so here's your header, here's your you know, primary navigation, your carousel sliders, et cetera. These are all pieces of you know, this whole structure. And so the wireframe serves to kind of communicate the relationships between all of these different components of the website. And uh, you know, once again, if, if your developer who is, I guess, a construction worker in this analogy, um, they're gonna use that as a reference very likely when they're you know, building your house or website. So I wanna like, stress this repeatedly that paper is like probably the most critical tool 
that I work with when producing wireframes. And so today I'll, I'll be talking to you about kind of the process that I follow at Chapter 3, which is truly like my process. It's not you know, the way to solve every single thing, and there are tons of different uh, software solutions out there now. But paper is kind of like universally a good and helpful thing. You can crumple it up and like throw it away very easily. You can you know, iterate rapidly. Um, lately, I've been using a large kind of 11 by 17 pad of graph paper. Uh, you can just use scraps of you know, printer paper or whatever you've got lying around. Uh, but I always, like, without fail, start on paper and force myself to kind of work through the, the first stage of the process on paper. Seriously. <laughs> so you can meet your, your new best friend here is uh, a humble box. This is the, the kind of friend who would, like, move you into a new apartment. Um, and he even has a, a little friendly face. So I, I use a box you know, very liberally when I'm sketching out wireframes. Uh, it could represent an image. It could represent you know, a, a chunk of the page that I'm going to fill in later that I don't quite want to think about yet. So often my, my first pass on a wireframe for a given page could be you know, just a series of these boxes. And you know, I label one like header, sidebar, main content. Uh, footer and that sort of thing. And that can get you just thinking about, you know, how are these things relating to each other? What are the general uh, proportions and how, how should they be, uh, you know, harmonized? And then I'll kind of add increasing fidelity uh, as I work through these. So I want to show you some examples. Uh, and I basically wanted to show you how ugly my wireframes often are and how that's a totally good and cool thing. So these are live, you know, real-life examples of wireframes that I've used on client projects in the past. And you'll get to see kind of some variety in, in the approach, and then uh, we'll, we'll step you through it. So on the, on the screen here, you're seeing you know, a basic news page. Uh, I didn't bother writing out you know, all the list items. I've got a big box for like, a featured area. I know I'm going to have some stuff in the sidebar. And like, this is enough for me to look at this page and start to feel out, you know, is this working? Is this starting to uh, communicate everything that we needed to communicate? And I should clarify that up until this point, uh, I would also have been involved in the strategy on this project, typically. Um, that's the way we usually work at Chapter 3. So we've already defined goals for this page. Uh, we know, you know who the, the primary audience is, what the key calls to action would be, what all of those kind of what we call content buckets, uh, the main kind of chunks of content on the page. I have some sense of what needs to be accounted for. And so once I have a wireframe, it's serving to kind of start figuring out that hierarchy of information. So you can see here, going from paper to digital, um, it's, it's pretty similar. It's not you know, super different. Uh, you can see all of these critical elements. I still have you know, a box in there. And then here is the, you know, the, the final uh, live page. And you can see that next to the wireframe. And once again, things didn't change you know, all that much. Visual styling has been applied, color, typography, images. Um, all of which I try to keep out of my wireframes as much as possible. So here's another one. Uh, basic, you know, ugly little paper guy. And you'll see that I often take little notes in the margins. I kind of draw arrows for things. If I forgot something, it's OK. Just like, you know, make yourself notes for later. A lot of times, too, you know, projects can be put on hold. They could be drawn out. Um, it's, it's good to leave yourself those little notes for your future self so that you can pick this up months later and remind, you know, be reminded, oh, that's, that's what that's for. Or I often use that space to often um, make myself you know, suggestions, like try, try a different layout here, that sort of thing. So here's some, some just details of a few of those guys. And then once again, uh, we've got the digital wire next to the paper. Structurally, it's all doing the same thing. And then, again, the final page next to the wireframe. I'll let that soak in for a second. Uh, so here, here's a more recent example uh, on graph paper. And you can see I made a, a ton of notes kind of in the margins. And 
you know, like try this thing differently here, or this content should be this. Consider using you know a different format here, or whatever. It's it's whatever is useful to you. Um, and side note, graph paper totally rules for this. And then the the digital next to it. And in this case, this was for uh, a tablet instance. So we have some tablet-y stuff. And then the final comp next to the final wireframe. So I'll, I'll say it again. You know, A few little elements moved around, but on the whole, you can see that uh, the core structure was maintained throughout the process. Here's an example from the, uh, the same project where I was looking at some different ways to approach the primary navigation in that same tablet state. So again, paper is a great way to try out some different things very quickly. You can have these things next to each other and like, you know, compare them side by side, show it to the person next to you, like, does this make sense? Would you know where to click? Uh, and it's, it's super easy to just very quickly work through that. And then here's what, you know, the, uh, the design comp ended up looking like. And you can see side by side um, that the, the sketch, you know, reasonably translated to where we ended up. We ended up dropping icons and some extra text and things, but uh, it was a valuable you know, step to, to be working through paper. And another one showing a mobile home page. So, you know, if you don't have enough room in one column, like mobile pages get super long, I will just kind of, you know, continue it in the next column. And in this particular case, we've been trying some different things at Chapter 3 because, you know, increasingly our sites need to be responsive. And accounting for that uh, used to be, like, make a wireframe for every state, for every page. So if you're doing, you know, desktop, tablet, mobile, to, to simplify it, um, you ended up, you multiply everything, you know, by, by two or three. So in this case, I did paper wireframes and then sat down and collaborated with one of our developers, and we built a live HTML responsive prototype um, that was able to go you know, directly from paper to prototype. And uh, we've had a lot of success doing this so far. It's definitely not relevant for every single project, but you know, it's, it's working out. So here's kind of the, the HTML prototype that we built. And you can see just kind of, it, it's really simple. In this case, we were just adding some responsive states to an existing desktop site. So they already had like the basic styling taken care of. We didn't have to worry about that. So we kind of inherited that on mobile, and uh, it worked out. And then here's just a few other examples of just showing, you know, it's just really sketchy. You don't need to have any sort of drawing ability to produce these things. This should be ever present in the back of your head. Like, keep it simple. The purpose of these wireframes is, you know, not to communicate the beautiful design of the site. It's meant to you know, very pragmatically communicate hierarchy of information, what's on the page. Um, think about, you know, if, if you could show this to somebody, would they be able to surmise the basic functionality of that page? And if so, then that's great. So I like to say your, your wireframe should be ugly, but more accurately, they should be ruggedly functional. Um, think kind of more, more Hemingway and less Dickens. Uh, you know, keep it very concise. Be as, as brief as you can. Just strip out all that extra stuff because it, you know, it becomes extra visual noise. Clients react to that. It becomes a distraction. So this is kind of the, the billboard for wireframes. You might have seen this if you were coming in from the airport. Uh, just use Helvetica and call it a day. Like, why? What are you thinking? You know, just, just use Helvetica. Uh, unless you know, your client may have a very particular typeface that they use that's so strongly associated with their brand that you know, their eyes would burn if they look at Helvetica in a wireframe. Uh, otherwise, just, just use this. Or use uh, Comic Sans if you're <laughs> using Balsamic and you don't know how to change the default. 
uh, you might end up with some wireframes that look like this, which is also totally fine. The other thing you need to be careful of is making sure clients understand what a wireframe is. Um, so maybe you've run into this problem where, you know, oh, I made this beautiful wireframe, and the client's like, what, what is this? This doesn't look good. This, like, this is not acceptable. Our website can't look like that. So it's important to manage those client expectations and you know, set them up for what, what they're going to see uh, so that it's not a big surprise when they see something that's all black and white with some blue links and uh, Comic Sans or <laughs> Helvetica. Also important, uh, don't let yourself get married to like, layout decisions that you make during the wireframing phase. Uh, you are establishing structure, but like it's pretty inevitable that you know once you start making it visual and applying more styling, you're going to change your mind. You'll think something that was a great idea, you know, a few weeks ago, no longer really works in practice. Um, so it's important to kind of be flexible as well, as long as you're not you know throwing everything out and screwing over a developer who may have started building the site. Um, we occasionally will start building sites from the wireframes while the visual design process is, is still ongoing. Uh, it depends on you know, the nature of the client and our timeline and all those factors, but that's, that's also a possibility. So related to kind of keeping things simple, you really want to just minimize your color palette unless you have like a really good reason for it to be in there. Uh, like I was saying, any extra noise just becomes, you know, uh, other possible points for feedback, which can be unproductive at this point in the process. And if, if the discussion starts kind of going off the rails a little bit, you, know, you can ask your client, like, is this layout communicating the correct content hierarchy and use you know, big words and make them feel intimidated? Uh, no, don't do that. But say, you know, does, is this wireframe representing all of the functionality that needs to be accounted for on this page? And you know, those are the ways to kind of have a more productive uh, discussion about wireframes. So likewise, use color to communicate functionality. You're not using color at this stage to you know, communicate a mood or a tone or you know, emotion. Uh, I'd say you know, make your links blue. Like the default, that beautiful blue that we all know. Uh, if you have something like a cancel button or like a delete function, something like that on your page, you know, use red. Otherwise, just uh, stick to black and white. If you're putting any photography in there, um, it's helpful to like you know make that black and white. Depending on your tools, like in in Adobe Fireworks, which we happen to use for a lot of stuff, you can just apply a style that will make it grayscale and then. When you're ready to move to your visual comps, you can you know, delete that style and you're all good. So here's a, a few comps that kind of visually communicate how, um, how this use of color is pretty effective. You can look at any of these and you know where the links are on these pages. It's like no question. Uh, and likewise for, for things like buttons or uh, you know, some of these delete links and that sort of thing. Like it, it should be abundantly obvious where all of that stuff is falling. Now, if it's possible, it's great to use real copy, um, but that's not you know, really realistic a lot of the time. Uh, so don't be afraid to use placeholder stuff. It's important, though, to kind of estimate the, the general length of how, you know, what the copy is going to be eventually so that you're not putting in paragraphs when it's going to be you know, a two-sentence blurb. Um, and that's where it's, it's really on you to start thinking about that and to, to offer some guidance to your clients, too. Because they, their instinct is often, you know, they have this huge page of information, and it all needs to get crammed in there. Um, but this is a, an opportunity for you to say, hey, if, if we can cut things down, be a little more concise, you know, it can actually make this page much more effective and then your wireframe can become a, a visual tool in that sense to kind of reinforce that. So there's a great site, which you may have seen, called Meet the Ipsums. And you, you've seen, I'm sure, classic like lorem ipsum text. Um, but sometimes you, know, you get tired of the same lorem ipsum, sit delor, Latin stuff. So this is a tiny selection, but there's, there's a Sagan ipsum with you know, Carl Sagan phrases and bacon and skateboarding terms. and 
Uh, the site has a whole bunch of like mostly goofy but somewhat legitimate terms. Uh, a few of my favorites, you might not have heard of this one. We've got hipster Ipsum. And actually my personal favorite is Riker Ipsum. Because these just tend to be really cool phrases. I'll let you read those for a second. Um, although to be fair, like the reason lorem ipsum is so effective is that as non-English text, um, we don't tend to try to read it so it doesn't become a distraction. Um, you know, if you have real copy in there, or even if you if you write some fake copy that's like just plausible enough to seem like it might be real, uh, clients can get very distracted by that too, and we've we've definitely run into that before. So there are like multitudes, there's a whole universe of uh, software out there. I happen to use OmniGraffle once I'm moving from paper to digital. So I, I'll talk only briefly about you know, how I use OmniGraffle. Um, but I think it's a great tool if you are just kind of getting into this and want something to try out. Um, I think it makes things pretty easy. We also use OmniGraffle to build out all of our sitemaps uh, before we get to this point. And it, it's just easy to kind of make you know, flow charts and that sort of thing. It's pretty awesome. So here's kind of your basic, you know, here's a, a wireframe document. Um, you can have multiple pages. You can do you know, basic styling, fill, stroke, whatever. All, all the stuff that you would kind of expect. Uh, alignment tools. But the, the best part about OmniGraffle is probably stencils. And Stencils are like the biggest time saver uh, that I can imagine. So these are effectively pre-built little elements that you can you know, drag and drop into your document. Uh, so it's things like forms or uh, like a, a little calendar, things that, that are kind of annoying to mock up on your own, different like UI elements, uh, icons, and that sort of thing. And there are a couple sites that have uh, you know, good libraries of these things. So Graffletopia is kind of the biggest one. And I recently heard about uh, stencils.io. So Graffletopia was free for a really long time, and it was super cool. It's still cool, but you have to pay for it. Um, you get like one free download per month, which is really kind of meager, unless you, you want to portion out your downloads throughout the year. Um, but for like two bucks a month, you get access to a really big, robust library. Uh, they have some like individual kind of fancier stencils that cost more. You know, in the in the scope of like a typical project budget, this is like absolutely zero. It's almost like zero cost, um, but it is a cost. But they have a, a big library, high quality. Stencils has a more limited library, but they have some really good stuff too. They're basically just aggregating links to pre-existing free OmniGraffle stencils that are online. Uh, you can you know, search and browse, and they've got categories and stuff in Graffletopia. Uh, Stencils doesn't, but it's basically one page. You can just like scroll through it pretty quick. And uh, yeah, Graffletopia has a lot of stuff that you can find elsewhere if you want to dig for it. Um, and no, no account for stencils. So here's a couple of the, the stencil packs that I typically use that I've found to be most useful. Uh, this Konigi one is like kind of my gold standard, or used to be. And this is just a sampling of some of the elements that are included, but you can kind of get a sense. It's got you know, a bunch of different button styles, and like check boxes, and radio buttons, uh, like a little WYSIWYG, and tabs. And all of these are built you know, in OmniGraffle, so you can resize them, and it's like very friendly to that sort of thing. So this, this kind of stuff saves me a ton of time if I'm mocking up any sort of page that has form fields or any, you know, anything like this. Of course, there's a Twitter bootstrap one, uh, which is what you would expect, kind of all of our basic Twitter bootstrap elements, all those great little icons so you can like drag them right in. It's effectively you know, the same thing, but just with the, the Twitter bootstrap flavor applied to it. And there's also a Zurb Foundation. If you happen to dig Zurb Foundation or are already using it or just like the visual style of it, um, 
This one kind of functions the same way. And they've got you know, drop-down navs and carousels and all this good stuff. So here, here's just a quick example of, in practice, how you know, one of my wireframes that uses these stencils might look. So I've got a bunch of, I think these are mostly the Konigi ones. or No, these are Twitter bootstrap. Um, but this page is like 80% stencils and then some text around it. Uh, and it, it's really quick to throw these together. So I'll, I'll speak really briefly about other software. but And these are just a few of them. I know there was a presentation on Axure earlier today. Um, some people are, are you know, very, they, they swear by you know, this or that. But really, it, it doesn't matter what you're using. A lot of the software is not intended for wireframing at all, like um, InDesign or even Keynote. But you know, they can be really effective tools. It's really more about following kind of the, the basic principles of building these things um, than it is you know, finding a tool that can do every single fancy uh, feature that you need, although those are great too. So let me kind of sum up some of these key bullet points. Paper is extremely important. Uh, you should always keep it simple, keep things ruggedly functional, like Hemingway. Minimize your color palette. Don't be afraid to use some placeholder copy. And OmniGraffle is pretty cool, but you know, if you have something better, go for it. Um, and So at, at chapter three, I will often take a, an old like, wireframe template that I made for a client, and then I'll just do a save as and like, modify things from there. And it's a really fast way to kind of get things up and running. I don't have to worry about like, building this out again. So uh, last year, I put together a wireframe template that uh, you can go and download. Uh, and it covers just some basic pages. It uses some of these stencils. Um, but you can open it up and kind of pick it apart and see like, how one of these documents might be built and you know, save it out yourself and then mess with it. Uh, so it's got you know, a basic home page. Although at this point, this is, uh, this is based on our old website, but that's fine. Uh, it's you know, a generic blog sort of thing. We've got like a blog post. And uh, so you can go on and. It is available for download, and thank you for asking. Oh, <laughs> it's available for download right here. Tiny.cc slash C3 wireframe. And it's free. But, I mean, and, and truly, like, it's, it's very basic, but it's a good way to just start looking at this and thinking about it and, like, picking it apart a little bit. Oh, no. If you go to the Chapter 3 website and you find my blog post about wireframing in OmniGraffle, there's definitely an a up-to-date link there. I thought that this guy was still alive. That's OK. Uh, I'll tweet it out, too, after this session. Um, but you know what? That's, that's what I have to kind of talk through right now. I would love to kind of spend more time taking questions and like talking more about kind of workflow in, in more detail. Um, so I guess you should probably go up to that microphone so we can all hear you because this is being recorded. And uh, if you ask a question, or honestly, even if you don't, we've got some free goodies up here. So yeah. All right. Um... I, besides the templates that you provided that will probably provide a pretty decent foundation for different sites, home pages, and even different sizes of like responsive, I imagine mobile and desktop, mm -hmm. um, if you need to build something from scratch and it does have to be for desktop and mobile, is there a software that can kill two birds with one stone? Or do you mm -hmm. always just end up doing, you know, I, I guess almost twice the work or something. Or what do you recommend? Sure, there there is software that does this. I mean, Macaw is now out. 
Um, and that I, I haven't had the time to like dig into it. Um, and I believe Axure also lets you build you know a responsive prototype. Um, in I haven't actually worked with those like. I have made uh, separate pages in my OmniGraffle document that are like the mobile state. Um, and so it is like a little more time consuming, but the fact that you're using things like stencils allows you to put those pages together really quickly. Uh, so it still eats some time, but it's not, it's not as bad as you might think. Uh, and you're able to kind of duplicate things and reuse them um, fairly often. Thanks. So, yeah. <laughs> question is, why did you pick OmniGraffle? What are some of the strengths, and how does it compare with Balsamic? Sure. Um, so OmniGraffle, I, I just kind of happened to pick it up. I don't know that, I'm trying to remember how I, I first used it. Um, it basically was straightforward enough. I started using it for sitemaps, and uh, what I like about it is it's easy to kind of select a lot of elements and resize things and move them around. and uh, previously, I should also clarify, we were using fireworks to make all of our wireframes um, before, and we still do occasionally uh, if it's like a little bit more high fidelity. Um, but OmniGraffle was just really fast. I would say some of the drawbacks, um, it can be a little janky sometimes, like the interface is not the best, um, but the stencils were like kind of the killer selling point for me. Because that's you know the bulk of a lot of this work, and being able to just drag in those elements uh, is hugely helpful. Yeah, I think at one point I did I don't know 50 or 60 wireframes in like a couple days, um, thanks to the, the magic of OmniGraffle and the stencils. So I'm trying to embrace the uh, paper prototyping model, and yeah. um, the challenge I'm finding is that um, if I'm sketching alone in my office, it's hard to pipe those over to the client to get feedback because everything you do needs to be explained to them, and you need to talk through all the options and get their feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you work that into your workflow as far as, uh, I guess, scheduling regular, regular meetings with them, or how do you not let that lack of communication interrupt your, interrupt your own workflow? Sure. So in our case, like I'm never showing the paper wireframes to a client. Actually, that's that's pretty important, okay. um, or very rarely. If if I'm doing something like a paper straight to an HTML prototype, then like we might discuss that with the client, and I would, you know, just shoot them with my iPhone and uh, like upload the photos to Dropbox from my phone, um, and that that's been like reasonably fast for me. There are I'm I'm totally blanking on the names, but there are apps where you can take a series of pictures and you know effectively build a quick little prototype just on your phone and you set like the areas and you can say this tapping this area of this photo links you to this next page um, that's pretty cool so those exist and that that so seems you actually, um, when you you share your paper prototypes with your uh, coworkers basically right and yes. so their sign off is basically enough for you to move to the next level um Yeah, okay. We, we have done paper, I guess, more directly with the clients. It's, it's less frequent for me. Um, I mean, there's a whole range, too. If I, let's see here. I'm, I'm struggling with a difficult client. Who yeah. We have once a week meetings, and they're like, I don't like the design here. And I'm like, I'm here to talk about UX. Uh, I'm looking for a good example for you here. So like, this one, I wouldn't show to a client unless we were like BFFs. Um, because I just think that this, this isn't as productive. But honestly, like working on graph paper, I can make these things look pretty sharp and everything is like really you know, clean and, uh, and marked out. So it can be like pretty legitimate. Um, cool, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, I was just wondering Hi. a bit more with when you're presenting your wireframes to users or clients. I think especially if it's a new project, I find sometimes because it's for your users, it's their first time seeing anything, mm -hmm. and it's the first time their ideas are coming to life. And so some of the conversation is certainly layout related. They might say like, yeah, I like this. But then often the conversation goes totally into different realms of like functionality and all these other things. And it's I find it's useful conversation because I think that okay. the first images spark it, but how do you manage it so that you're getting what you 
what the purpose of the wireframe is without losing this other information. I mean, it's, you ask like very direct targeted questions, like is this page doing you know, this particular thing? Um, and if, if you do that rather than just putting it in front of them and saying like, what do you think? then it tends to be a little more productive. I mean, they still will get sidetracked. And it's totally OK to say, like, you know, this isn't really the point in the process to talk about that. Like, we'll, you know, we'll get there in a few weeks when we're doing like visual comps or something like that. Um, I don't know. It, what, what sort of question? You, you, you said that they're still productive. Well, I guess maybe sometimes like a new insight or something that like has not been in the discovery process might come out, and you want to make mm -hmm. sure that doesn't get lost in the like saying, like, oh, okay, well, that's a bit later in the process, but you also want to make sure it doesn't get lost at the same time. Yeah, I mean, for those things, I, I just try to take a note of it um, and like remember it for later. But I mean, some, sometimes that is really important too. Uh, yeah, or like if if I do have live relatively live copy in the wireframe and they're like, oh, you know, now that we see this in a like a page layout, we want to, you know, edit this copy or change these words. Like that can still be a relevant and productive discussion even if it's not directly related to the wireframe. So I guess you, you don't need to be like hyper strict about it too. Maybe that's helpful. <laughs> Uh, you said that you're involved in most of the process leading up to the wireframing process as well. I was wondering if you could give like a brief synopsis or understanding of your architecting process or maybe just a little bit about your discovery process uh, just to understand what happens in, in, up until this point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, the kind of functional requirements would already be defined before I'm involved. You know, that's handled in kind of the sales process. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm usually there for the, the kickoff and we work through we send our clients a strategy document that they fill out that covers, you know, what, what are the goals of this site, um, what are kind of your tactics. Uh, it covers, a, you know, if, if your website were an animal, what kind of animal would it be, and that kind of thing, where they can start generating adjectives that we would then use later. Um, so that gives us kind of a, a foundation. From there, we usually go through personas, and we talk through the main kind of audiences on the site and build out personas for each of those distinct audiences. So then we're defining goals for each of those personas, and that gives us a little more information. Um, from there, we build a site map, so we know what the general you know, information architecture will be for the navigation of the site. And at that point, we're identifying which pages we expect to be distinct design templates because you know, we're not going to design every single page on the site. Um, from there, we do page tables, which are looking at those template pages and making or defining the goals for those specific pages and also defining what the main chunks of content need to be on those pages. And that, that page tables document is what is most relevant to wireframing, because that's what I kind of have as a reference to make sure, like, are we including everything, first of all, and then is it kind of in the right order and you know, represented with the right hierarchy? Um, so then we produce wireframes, and then we go off into you know, the visual design and do mood boards and like, visual comps. Um, yeah, and it, I, it is kind of rare that, like, in our case, it's one individual who is covering that entire process up until it's like, handed off to a developer. Um, so I, I, I realize that's kind of sometimes atypical. Um, in my experience, I've often seen that a wireframe, kind of the functionality that's defined there gets lost in translation by the time a developer mm -hmm. gets it. At chapter three, what do you guys do to make sure everybody stays on the same page before you know, any time is wasted? We, we totally struggle with that too. And we, have, we always kind of try new things to see like maybe this will get us there a little bit closer. Um, I will include like annotations sometimes in the wireframe, uh, which you could throw you know throw it in there in like hot pink or something, and just add a little bit of text so you know that that can provide some reinforcement. Um, we will also build you know have like a centralized Google Doc that spells out all of the different functionality and kind of our expectations for how those things would work. So you know something like a carousel slider could seem super simple, but there are lots of variables that go into it. Is it going to auto advance? Like what, what's the duration of each slide? Or you know, how many do, would we cap it at? Um, so we try to kind of like define those things as well. 
um, in like a, a document, uh, it can still get glazed over and it's easy to miss. And you know, sometimes more complex functionality just can't be communicated in a single wireframe. Um, so we also do a handoff with our developers. Um, at whatever point they're starting development, we sit down with them and walk them through like as much of the project as is reasonable um, to make sure that they have an opportunity to ask questions and you know we can clarify all that stuff. So it's, it's really about the communication, I would say, more than anything. There's not like one particular tool or something that solves it for us. When that functionality is then ready, are you the one who tests it to make sure that it matches what was on the wireframe, or? Yeah, I mean, ideally, it, again, it, it doesn't always happen. We try to make it happen that yeah. the designer stays involved with the project, you know, as it's going through the development process. And we encourage our, our developers to keep, you know, really open communication with, you know, our design team so that we can see how it's coming along, or if they have a question about something, like, they just, you know, will ping us at any time. Um, and so that, that seems to work out pretty well for us, too. Thanks. Yeah. Any other brave souls? I'll just kind of chill up here too, uh, if you're if you're a little bit shy about going up to the mic, or you, you can shout it. <laughs> uh, how often do you guys build prototypes for the wireframes? And what's your criteria for deciding when you need to use a prototype to demonstrate something as opposed to a wireframe? Mm -hmm. Um, lately, it's okay. So the, the question was, um, when do we decide when we actually build a prototype versus you know going a full digital wireframe route? Um, it's kind of a recent thing for us, but it's been projects where there's like an existing site and we're just kind of extending it, and um, we know that like we kind of understand what all the functionality is already. Um, do you have anything to add to that? I mean, it it's kind of hit, hit or miss. Yeah. Yeah, if if it's like a heavily responsive site where we want to be able to, you know, test it on a device, that's that's helpful too. Um, we're doing it kind of more and more though, and I'm having enough success with it that I I want to like continue doing that. Um, it, you know, right now it's it's exclusively for like responsive sites though. If it's just a desktop site, I don't think it's really worth the time. Currently, that's what we're doing. Um, yeah, and even you know the HTML prototype isn't even built in in Drupal. It's just kind of its own little standalone thing. Mm -hmm. Hey, um, when you move into the high fidelity, um, you know, design yeah. for your your site, are you using OmniGraphle as a starting point? Or are you redoing your grid and? So yeah, recreating what, what you had already done. Yeah, thank you. You're, you're reminding me of things that I probably should have mentioned earlier. <laughs> but um, when I'm working in OmniGraphle, I tend to not use a grid, which sounds maybe silly. But it's important to me at that stage to keep it really loose. So if I know it's going to be like a three-column layout, I kind of, you know, I'll make them each even and evenly spaced. But I'm not strict about getting like things pixel perfect at that point. It's more about the, the general idea of the page. Um, so it does introduce more work because I, I have to recreate things from scratch when I start building my comps in Fireworks. Um, but to me, like, we used to do a wireframe in Fireworks and then just save as to the, our design comp. And you get lazy and, like, you, it doesn't challenge you to, like, rethink about the, the layout necessarily. Like, it's important to not change the structure a bunch, but it's also important to have the flexibility to try some new things at that point in the process, because that's when you're doing the, the real creative work. Um, so yeah, there is like a little bit of extra effort required, but I like keeping it separate. It's like the same way you, know, you want to keep your home life and your work life separate or something. Like wireframes and design kind of live in their own castles. Um, you got to travel between the two. That's a, that's a weird analogy. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. What do you think you guys are going to use since Adobe's dropping Fireworks? Good question. Yeah, so the, the drop of Fireworks support was a crushing blow to us. Although, honestly, Fireworks still works fine, and it will continue to work okay. 
Uh, I've been using Sketch um, from Bohemian Coding, and I've, I've had some success with that. Uh, it feels pretty nice. It's not quite there yet. There's like some critical features that are still missing. Uh, like exporting documents is a little goofy. You can do, you know, like global styles, but uh, you know, it's, it's definitely getting there. They seem to be the strongest contender for like a pure fireworks replacement. But for the time being, we're, we're still using fireworks really heavily. Uh, I don't think Adobe's gonna change their mind or anything, but you know, we go and pick at their offices every Thursday. There's like five of us that really like fireworks. Actually, there's a whole group in the Bay Area, like a meetup group of fireworks users. Uh, Okay, I'm going to cut it off here. Feel free to come up and chat. Thank you all for coming and get some swag.